thank you very much. Uh, uh, many thanks, Juan, for the presentation, and many thanks to the uh, organizers for <clears throat> their kind invitation. It's uh, it's an honor for me to be here in this seminar um, that I like uh, a lot. So uh, today I will present a result uh, which uh, has been in, obtained in collaboration with Juan uh, Manuel and Jun Cheng Wei. So. And it is about the uh, uh, construction of leap leapfrogging vortex rings for uh, the uh, Euler equation for incompressible fluids. Let me uh, recall here uh, the Euler equations in, in R3. Um, this is a, a set of uh, equations that describes the evolution in time of uh, the velocity that I call here U of the fluid. The fluid is has uniform density and there is no viscosity. So the acceleration on the left hand side is equal to uh, the sum of the uh, density of force that is uh, here uh, represented by, uh, by the gradient of P and P is a scalar function. It denotes, uh, it's, it represents the pressure of the fluid. Uh, besides, the, the fluid is assumed to be incompressible, so the divergence of U equal to zero. Uh, the three components of U, as well as the pressure, are the unknown in these equations. There is an equivalent formulation uh, which involves uh, uh, what is called uh, the uh, vorticity. This is a vector field I denoted by omega bar. This is the curl of the velocity. And uh, uh, besides, you can introduce uh, uh, another vector field, psi, uh, so that u is the curl of psi, the existence of psi followed by from the incompressibility condition on, uh, on u. And if you take the curl of the equation I just wrote before, you get uh, the following uh, uh, system of equation for the vorticity uh, that is transported uh, by means of the velocity. And then you have also here uh, another term, which is the so-called vortex stretching term. And um, the function psi, the vector field of psi, sorry, is related to uh, the vorticity through this uh, Newtonian potential. Um, the topic, the, the two um, objects I will uh, spend my time today are uh, vortex rings and leapfrogging. So uh, a vortex ring is a solution to the Euler equation where you can see that uh, the vorticity, namely the region where the fluid rotates very fast, is uh, uh, concentrated around uh, a circle. This circle travels with a constant velocity in the direction orthogonal to the plane where the circle is. So you can think of it as a tubular neighborhood of a circle where the uh, vorticity is concentrated. And in particular, I am interested in those vortex rings whose uh, section uh, are relatively thin uh, or small in, compa in comparison with, the, say, for instance, the radius of uh, the ring. <clears throat> this is a picture. Uh, that wants to represent a vortex ring. This is a, a smoke ring on the top of the Volta volcano Etna in Italy. And uh, besides, the second part will be about uh, the construction of leapfrogging. And this is a solution uh, of the Euler equation in which you see several uh, vortex rings, each one with a thin cross section. They move in the same direction and they have the same uh, center. And besides, they have comparable uh, radius. So that each ring travels as a vortex ring. 
And beside, they feel the presence of the other vortex rings. So the, the movement, the evolution of each vortex ring is modified by the presence of uh, other closed vortex rings. So both of these solutions were uh, described by the fundamental paper in 1858 by Helmholtz. And, um, both these uh, solutions uh, belong to a specific class of solution to the Euler equation, the so-called uh, axisymmetric uh, solution with the no swirl. So if your point X in R3, you represent it uh, using cylindrical coordinate, coordinates, R theta and zeta, uh, the velocity uh, has the following form. So if e, we denote by ER uh, the, the radial direction, unitary direction, E theta, the, tang the tangential direction, and E zeta, the vertical direction, the unitary vertical direction, a, a velocity is axisymmetric if its component only depend on R, zeta, and T, but do not depend on theta. And it is called the no swirl if, uh, as you can see in this decomposition, you don't have component along the vector E theta. So the velocity only go in the radial direction and in the vertical direction with uh, components depending on R zeta and T, but on, not on theta. Okay, if, if, this, if you start with a, a, a velocity of this form, well, the, along the flow, uh, the velocity maintains that form. The vorticity then is uh, easily uh, computed. It goes uh, uh, in the direction of E theta, in the tangential direction. And you have a omega theta, the vorticity. It's a scalar function that you can compute easily. From the divergence-free condition, you can uh, get also a, a, the existence of a scalar function psi theta. Uh, so that if you denote by uh, psi bar the vector field psi theta e theta, so in the tangential uh, derivative, then uh, you have that uh, uh, psi bar and omega bar are related in this way. And you can uh, derive the component of the uh, velocity uh, by computing the partial derivative of psi theta. And the existence of the psi theta is guaranteed by the divergence-free condition. Now, um, all our variables here are zeta and t, in particular, R and zeta belong to the set sigma. R is positive and zeta belongs to R. Now, uh, if, we, if we do a, an extra change of variable, so uh, omega theta and psi theta that are the uh, vorticity and the stream function, we call, uh, we introduce omega and psi as omega theta divided by R and psi theta divided by R. It's just a change of variable that uh, allow us to conclude that the Euler equation becomes the following system of uh, equation uh, inside this red box that is called the star. Let me, have a look uh, at this equation together. Um, so the vorticity, this uh, scalar function uh, omega is transported uh, by a, a vector here that depends on psi, but where you also have a, a weight, this R square. Uh, besides, uh, after this change of variable involving cylindrical uh, coordinates as well as uh, this uh, change in, in, in the vorticity and the stream function uh, gives us that uh, the vorticity and the stream function are related through uh, an elliptic operator 
that I call Laplacian uh, five. So Laplacian five is uh, defined here. Um, I call it a Laplacian five simply because if you have a look at it, you recognize that the first two terms are uh, the uh, um, radial Laplacian in dimension two, uh, to which in dimension four, sorry, to which you add uh, a, an extra uh, dimension. So let me call this elliptic operator Laplacian five. And the way the stream function and the, uh, and the vorticity are related is through uh, the Laplacian five. Now we look for a, a solution. Uh, we are assuming that the fluid is uh, at infinity uh, is at rest. And so we, we ask that uh, the stream function at infinity goes to zero. And besides, we have this uh, boundary condition here, the R of Psi equal to zero along the zeta axis. This is not um, a physical condition. It is simply required in such a way that uh, the solution to the Euler equation is um, regular uh, um, at the origin. It's non-singular uh, at the origin. Uh, so what we are interested in, uh, if we look for a uh, uh, vortex ring or leapfrogging, are a solution to uh, the system of equation that is uh, inside this uh, box star. Um, let me mention that uh, um, a Judovic theory for uh, Euler in dimension two uh, can be body can be modified to get uh, a uniqueness of solution and an existence a global existence in time of solution for the axisymmetric uh, Euler equation with no swirl, uh, provided that uh, the initial vorticity uh, satisfies a, a certain condition, which uh, we we assume we will work in this class of uh, initial conditions. So uh, what is a vortex ring? A vortex ring is a solution of the star box system of equation uh, given by a traveling wave traveling with constant uh, speed c in the vertical zeta direction. In other words, it's, uh, it is a solution of star, which has the form uh, in terms of vorticity, say, a fixed function capital W naught of the variable r zeta minus ct. And the same goes for psi. So if you do the computation, you get that the star box equation becomes a star star blue system of uh, uh, say equation which uh, time disappeared. Okay, so um, it is, um, this is a remark that uh, <clears throat> we also do in, when we study the Euler equation in dimension two. Um, uh, the following observation is, is quite interesting. Uh, if you have a, a psi naught, a function of r and zeta, that is a solution of um, uh, the following semilinear elliptic equation. So this is the operator Laplacian five on psi naught equals a certain function, arbitrary function, smooth nonlinearity of uh, r squared psi minus c half. Assume you have an object like that. You have a solution psi zero. And then you define w zero as f as the right hand side. Then the pair psi zero, w zero uh, is a vortex ring, namely uh, solves the, the system uh, star star. I, I didn't put here the boundary condition and the condition at infinity, but, but 
So if you have a solution of this semi-linear elliptic equation plus boundary condition and condition at infinity, uh, this is a traveling wave solution to the axis symmetric with no swirl Euler equation. And in fact, this is the way in which Frankel, in two papers in 1917 and 1972, uh, proved the existence of vortex rings uh, whose uh, cross section are, uh, is small. There was a previous uh, result uh, by Maroon in the paper or in the papers uh, by Frankel, he's also able to describe in a very precise way um, the qualitative properties of uh, these vortex rings with the uh, small cross sections. In fact, what I would like to do uh, next is uh, somehow to describe uh, the mechanism that Frankel found uh, to construct the, the vortex ring, and in particular uh, to explain how the, the speed, the constant speed C, the radius of the ring that I will call R0, and the size of the small cross section that I will call epsilon are related. And this was discovered by Frankel. So in order to, uh, to understand uh, how this works, uh, uh, let me assume that uh, we have already a, a vortex ring. It's a pair W epsilon, psi epsilon. Epsilon is the size of the cross section. It's a small parameter. And we assume to have a vortex ring. And this vortex ring, uh, as in Frankel's uh, result, has a um, vorticity concentrated around this uh, uh, ring of radius, let me call it uh, R0. So, uh, the circle of radius R0 in this uh, cylindrical coordinate becomes uh, the point P0, okay? So a way to, this, to say, to express that the vorticity is epsilon concentrated around uh, the point P0 is to say that the vorticity has the form one divided by epsilon square, uh, so a huge constant times a fixed profile U, of x minus p naught divided by epsilon, where u is a, is a fixed profile uh, decaying at infinity sufficiently fast. And for us, um, for what I will discuss later, uh, it is convenient to choose uh, as u the kaufmann scully vortex. This is a solution of the 2D Euler equation, and it is also related to the Duville equation in R2. So let me assume that u has this decay. And so you can immediately uh, realize that uh, this vorticity here with this form, one over epsilon square u of x minus p naught divided by epsilon, if you take the limit as epsilon goes to zero, it concentrates as a Dirac uh, delta uh, at the point P0, which is exactly what we are trying somehow to describe. A vorticity very high if you are uh, at P0 and relatively small if you are far away from P0. Okay, so this is more or less uh, how the vorticity look like, looks like. And then we, we, we want to describe this, the stream function. Now, the Psi Epsilon. We, uh, the Psi Epsilon is related to, uh, to the vorticity through uh, this operator, Laplacian 5. The, the vorticity converged to a Dirac delta. We introduced then, it's relevant to introduce the Green's function of the operator Laplacian 5. So uh, I call it a G uh, and it solves uh, uh, this problem here. In particular, you can characterize uh, the function G if you are close to the point uh, of concentration P0 as um, a logarithmic term, 
which reminds you that the Laplacian five contains a two-dimensional Laplacian in a sense, DRR plus D zeta zeta, but with correction. And the correction are, if you look at the Green's function close to the point P naught, uh, there is a constant one, then uh, there is a correction which is linear in the R direction, but you don't have anything linear in the zeta, in the vertical direction. And then there are quadratic correction, which if you are close to P0, uh, are really small, so we can simply drop them. Uh, nevertheless, the stream function the Green's function as a singularity at P0. Uh, we don't want uh, a singularity at P0. We, we want to regularize this Green's function. And uh, we do it uh, simply adding to x minus P0 square, uh, epsilon square. So it, this epsilon square desingularizes uh, the logarithm. And we think of, say, epsilon as um, this uh, regularized uh, logarithm plus the linear corrections. Uh, now, it will be important uh, to describe this function close to the point P0. So we, it's convenient to introduce this scaled function Y, X minus P0 divided by epsilon, so that uh, the, the, the product uh, uh, here of the log and uh, the linear correction gets rewritten in the y variable in this way. So the part of the log contains a constant and um, a radial part, while this correction is like epsilon y1. And what we want to do now, so we have the we have the vorticity, we have the stream function, and uh, we want to check uh, under what condition on the speed on the R0 and on the epsilon, uh, what we have introduced is, if not a, a solution, a good approximate solution to be a vortex ring. So what we have to do is to compute this uh, scalar product here, the gradient perp of R squared psi epsilon minus C over two dot the gradient of W epsilon. So let me first distribute the gradient perp. The gradient perp first hits R squared, and this is here, then hits psi epsilon minus C over two, and this is here. Well, the first uh, term is rather explicit. We have psi epsilon, it's like minus log of epsilon. So we have to better understand the second term in this computation. So we oh, have- What the is E2? What is vector E2? Ah, sorry. E2 is uh, the vector uh, in the R zeta uh, variable zero one. So, Zero for it's it's of the vert is it's zeta sorry e two is it's zeta. Uh -huh. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the gradient perp is is like uh, the gradient rotated in this way with this uh, convection of, of sign. So let me compute uh, this uh, second term here. So gradient perp of psi epsilon dot gradient of w epsilon. Um, it is convenient to to compute it again in the expanded variable y and uh, by scaling it is convenient to multiply all the term by epsilon to power four but this is just cosmetics so when you compute the gradient perp of uh, psi epsilon um, so psi epsilon has two terms it's a product of two function when the gradient perp is here, you have the gradient of the log. Otherwise, you have the gradient of this uh, linear term. So when you have the gradient of the log, it's the gradient perp of a radial function dotted with the gradient of a radial function. This gives you zero. So the only thing that survives is when the gradient hits the linear um, uh, term epsilon y1. And when you do that computation, you get uh, again uh, e2 
which is in reality is zeta. And if you put together all these uh, computation, you get uh, that uh, uh, your uh, scalar product is uh, of size epsilon multiplied by a certain function here and multiplied by this, uh, this parenthesis, which uh, is um, a, an expression which depends on R0, the radius, C, the speed, the vertical speed, and the uh, epsilon, the size of the, tubular, the, of the tubular neighborhood of your ring. And you want to have a solution that this parenthesis is zero. And this gives you exactly this formula. And this formula was found, as I mentioned to you before, uh, by Frankel in his papers in 1970s. So the, the velocity C, the constant velocity C is proportional to log of epsilon and uh, multiplied by two divided by R0 and R0 is the radius of the ring. I should say that Frankel also uh, found this little o of one. This little o of one is a constant divided by the square root of log. And that constant depends on how basically on how you decide to regularize or to, to describe the vorticity. Okay, uh, uh, Frankel's solution, so vortex ring with epsilon size uh, um, section, uh, were not the first uh, uh, vortex ring found in literature. There is uh, uh, previous to, to Frankel result and the Maroon result. Uh, it was known Hill spherical vortex ring. And Nurbury um, ob obtained other uh, vortex ring that are perturbation of the Hill spherical vortex. And in his paper in 1974, uh, he proved numerically that there is um, a whole family of uh, a vortex ring joining uh, uh, the Hill spherical vortex to Frankel vortex ring with a small cross section. Uh, the literature on vortex ring is huge. There are uh, papers that um, approach uh, this problem via uh, variational methods. Um, also, there are a very interesting work by um, the group uh, uh, Cagliotti, Marchioro, Marchioro Pulvirenti, in which they, uh, they use uh, uh, conservation of quantities to get uh, information on, on the rings of, uh, but, 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 but let me uh, summar summarize then what we, what, what we get so far, what we got so far. So if we don't want to see uh, the, uh, the, the log epsilon here uh, in the velocity, you can scale time in this way. So you introduce tau, that is uh, log epsilon times t. And what we found so far is that uh, the core of the vortex ring is an epsilon tubular neighborhood of a circle uh, that you can call gamma, parameterized by arc length, if you want, and moving in time t. The circle has radius r, and it is traveling in the vertical direction with a constant uh, speed so two divided by r. This, uh, this uh, vortex ring uh, with a small cross section is a very a special uh, example of a, for, of a vortex filament, namely a solution to the Euler equation whose vorticity is concentrated uh, around the tubular neighborhood of a curve. And it has been uh, shown with a formal computation by Darrios that if you have such an object, the curve uh, evolve by the binormal flow. So your curve, in the derivative in time of your curve is two times the binormal, which 
coincides with uh, this, this ring traveling vertically with the velocity two divided by R, one divided by R is, is the curvature. And this is one of the, the few example uh, of uh, vortex filaments. I just want to mention that uh, another example, we found another example uh, with uh, Juan Davila, Manuel Del Pino and Jun Cheng Wei last year for um, uh, helical uh, uh, vortex rings, uh, vortex uh, filament. But, but now I, I would like to move to, to the leapfrogging. And um, so the leapfrogging is like in this picture here. We have, say, two uh, vortex rings. They, they, they have the same uh, center and they move in the same direction. They have a radius R1 and R2, and these radius, uh, these ra radii are comparable in size. So each ring travels as a vortex ring, but it also interacts with the other. And say, for instance, if your ring has a, a small radius, it means that it travels fast, right? So if it travels fast, like in this uh, red ring here, it, uh, ta it takes over the other ring whose radius is larger, and then it is traveling uh, slowly. Um, I would like to, to, to share with you this video that you can find in, uh, in YouTube, uh, which I think describes better than with words what I am trying to explain. So this is just a simulation. Uh, it's not an experiment. You have two uh, rings. They go in the same direction. Uh, they have comparable uh, radius. And uh, when one is smaller, it goes faster. And when one is uh, bigger, it goes slowlier. And they uh, penetrate one uh, the other um, uh, in this way. So, so this is what I would like to discuss with you now. This is the, the leapfrogging which, by the way, was described in words by Helmholtz, Helmholtz in 1858 in, with an extremely clear description. So if the two rings have the same direction of rotation, they travel in the same direction, the foremost widens and travels more slowly, the pursuer shrinks and travels faster till finally, if their velocities are not too different or their radius are comparable, it overtakes the first and penetrates it. And then the same game goes on in the opposite order so that the rings pass through each other uh, alternately. This is, these are the words of um, Helmholtz. Okay, so uh, uh, leapfrogging is again a solution of the box star equation, the axis symmetric no swir um, uh, Euler equation. Uh, but uh, so let me change time to get rid of the log. Tau is now the time. And um, the, the, ver the, the vorticity uh, is now expressed in the following way. It's almost like being uh, um, a, a vortex ring. So it's R, it's a function, it's given by a capital function W of R minus Z minus zeta minus two, R zero to power minus one log epsilon. Remember, this is the constant velocity Frankel found uh, but it is not a traveling wave. So it, it also depends uh, in time in the third variable. You take these assets and you put it inside uh, equation star, you get equation star, star, star. 
So uh, again, the stream function is related to the vorticity through the five uh, dimensional Laplacian. You have um, that uh, the vorticity capital W is transported by a, a vector here, which has a weight R square and the shift somehow. And of course, the uh, what we expect is that a, a vortex, uh, a leapfrogging, is uh, given by uh, its vorticity is given by the sum of vorticities of uh, vortex rings. So what I described before, we assume that the uh, vorticity of the leapfrogging is the sum of of the vorticity of vortex rings. Now, these assets conserve uh, automatically uh, the circulation, uh, at least in each uh, connected component of, um, of the vorticity. And uh, in order to have a conservation of L infinity norm, um, we need, okay, let me go back uh, to this expression uj. Uh, so each uj, is the, is the vorticity of a vortex ring if the, the point, the center qj and the scaling parameter epsilon j were time independent. But now in order to construct the leapfrogging, we need this parameter to depend on time. So in order to have an infinity norm conserved, we need this, re this relation that uh, the scaling parameter epsilon j square multiplied by the first component of each point qj, qj1. This is a function that is independent of time. And we choose it to be r0. r0 um, enters in the equation for the leapfrogging and uh, epsilon square. Okay, so in this way, the vorticity looks like uh, the sum of the vorticity of uh, vortex rings. And correspondingly, the stream function is the sum of the stream function of each vortex ring, as before. The only exception here is that the point now depends on tau, and epsilon, epsilon uh, j also depends on time. So let me try to uh, uh, check, um, as I did before formally, um, under what assumption uh, we have that uh, this approximate vorticity and vortex uh, uh, and the stream functions uh, satisfy the, the equation for the leapfrogging. So the, the equation for the leapfrogging had two terms. The first term is, uh, involves the time derivative of the vorticity and a quadratic term involving the gradient perp of psi, etc. Okay. So if I am close to one of these ring, I choose the ring qj, and I expand variable in this way, I can compute the first term in the equation for the leapfrogging. After multiplying it by r to power four, I get this expression here. So the derivative of the point with respect to tau. Now, let me compute, and this is a little bit more involved. Uh, this is why I want to describe, discuss that this with you the second term in the leapfrogging uh, equation. The second term in the leapfrogging equation, if you uh, multiply it by epsilon to power four, uh, is given by uh, this scalar product. Now, the trick here is uh, to uh, decompose psi. Remember that psi is just the sum of the psi j, psi one, up to psi k, and we are looking at what happens close to psi j. So I decompose psi as the psi j, where I am looking at the equation, 
And then I put minus the first component of qj minus one times the log epsilon. I, I do that because this scalar product here is just the equation of a vortex ring. So if I assume that each term is a vortex ring, this scalar product is small, and in fact is, is of order epsilon square. OK. And then since I, I in, the, in the equation I have r0 to minus 1, which is here, I subtracted this term. So I added it back here. And then I need to add all the other vortices, uh, stream functions. So the stream function uh, related to index i different from j. This is just reordering. OK, so the first term is epsilon squared. The reason being that each one of uh, the term is a vortex ring. If you compute this uh, second term here, you get um, this uh, expression where E2 is again E zeta. And finally, if you compute epsilon to power four times the gradient pair of uh, uh, this, it, this is the term that gives you the interaction between among uh, different vortex ring. So this term here um, is related to the fact that in reality, each vortex ring is, is uh, as a radius which is not constant in time. Okay, so it's the difference from being a real traveling wave solution. And this term takes into account of the interaction. So what you want to, if you want that this expression in bracket is zero, which becomes uh, this expression here in bracket, which uh, gives you the location of the point QJ. So uh, in order to have uh, a leapfrogging, uh, your point, uh, the center of the rings or the radius of the rings, um, do have to satisfy this system of ODE. Now, let me just do some quick computation. So this is log epsilon times Q, size Q. This is one over Q. And this is uh, log epsilon times Q minus R0. So each uh, ring, uh, we decided that each ring has a radius, which is all for all constant plus something of smaller order. This is to say that all the rings have comparable radius. Now, how small is uh, the next order is uh, decided by comparing these three terms here. And uh, if you choose the next order to be one divided by the square root of, square root of log epsilon, these three terms here have the same size in terms of epsilon. So if you put qj of tau uh, in this way, and you substitute to the pre into the previous uh, system of ODE, you get the following uh, final um, uh, system of ODE that I call capital L in the points qj, which are a distance one over square root from the fixed radius R0. Now, this, uh, this is a, a Hamiltonian system. And if you do uh, the, the very simple case of taking very simple, uh, the, the, the case of uh, two points, two rings, and one ring, Q is, they are opposite. Q1 is equal to minus Q2. Uh, the system, the Hamiltonian system reduces to this one, and these are the level curves of the system. So if you start, for instance, with an initial condition 
uh, here uh, you get periodic orbit periodic orbit uh, as a solution to the um, this uh, hamiltonian system so let me uh, <clears throat> give uh, the theorem that we proved uh, with Juan Davila, Manuel Del Pino, and Jun Cheng Wei. Assume you have a solution of the leapfrogging, the, the dynamic, the Hamiltonian system, in a, a time of interval zero capital T, in which you don't have collision. Then uh, you can find a, a, a smooth solution of the leapfrogging uh, and the points mm -hmm. QJ, Q epsilon J of this form. So are the fixed radius plus what we described here, this little qj, but with other correction of this size. And the solution uh, as vorticity of this form here. So it is the sum of the vorticity of vortex ring plus a, a reminder. Uh, the, uh, the, the vorticity are built upon the, the Kaufman Schooly vortex, and uh, we have a, a control on the reminder uh, of this type um, for any tau in, a, in the fixed interval of time, zero capital T. Uh, so I, I would like to, to discuss, uh, and maybe I, I am running out of time, uh, but just one uh, detail, because uh, I told you before that uh, uh, solution to the axisymmetric uh, uh, with no swirl Euler equation are global in time under reasonable initial condition. Uh, and besides the uh, uh, in in this uh, diagram here, you can see that the solution to, to this Hamiltonian system is, is periodic. But our result um, uh, has control on the reminder only on an interval of time or on a finite interval of time, zero capital T. So uh, for an interval of time in which you have a solution to the Hamiltonian system, uh, with no collision, uh, then you have this uh, uh, control on the reminder. And there are um, uh, some numerical experiment that we found that uh, tells us uh, that this is not um, something strange. In this numerical uh, simulation, you see a vortex ring with the two rings. Sorry, you see a leapfrogging with the two rings. Uh, so they cross one each other, but only a finite number of time, and then they simply disappear. And this is also a picture taken by from this uh, paper by Alvarez and Ning. So you see two rings; they interact. They pass one each other, and then they deteriorate. Uh, just uh, two words uh, about the construction of uh, this uh, solution. Uh, it, it is um, a scheme that has been uh, used in other contexts, and it, con it consists in um, constructing a first approximate solution uh, which in this case is rather uh, delicate because you have uh, scale that are different. So in this case, you have these two rings and the cross section is of size epsilon, but the distance is, is of size one over square root of log epsilon. So they, they collide when epsilon goes to zero. Uh, and then uh, to find after you find uh, um, an approximate solution, uh, you can obtain um, a, a solution uh, using, for instance, we obtain the solution using uh, the what we call the inner outer gluing scheme, 
which uh, consists in the fact that uh, you decompose the reminder in uh, something that uh, describes what happens close to the, the points and something that describes uh, what happens far away from the points. And uh, this has been um, a technique that uh, we developed uh, in a previous paper uh, with uh, Juan Davila, Manuel Del Pino, and Jun Zheng Wei uh, for point concentration in 2D Euler equation. The final remark. Um, there is a huge literature about um, uh, the study of the Hamiltonian system for the points. So the reduced dynamics, capital L. And this goes back to Dyson, Hicks, Lamb. Um, there are many works on numerical simulation for leapfrogging. And the first time this uh, leapfrogging has been experimentally found with a vortex ring done by smoke, with the smoke, is, uh, was in 1978 by Yamada and Matsui. And a final remark, uh, similar, an equation relatively similar to the Euler equation is the gross pitayevsky equation. And um, in that case, in three dimension, the leapfrogging was uh, already found in a paper by uh, Gerard and Smets. Um, we believe that their method maybe cannot be adapted to get uh, the leapfrogging for, um, for the Euler equation. Okay, I think I ran out of time, so I, I stop here. Thank you very much.